we are going to study these books. And what we're doing at this hour is we're taking six men, and these six men will deal with these six books. And I think you're going to want to get your Bibles, and you're going to want to get your notebooks, and to take down the content. Now, what we have done in this session is this. Many times uh, throughout this study, we have dealt with uh, uh, some, well, just some tremendous material, and uh, some of which has been uh, rather technical, and uh, that's needed. And the men that dealt with this did a masterful job. We, in this session, are going to go to the opposite side and are going to be dealing with the practical. And what we're doing today at this session is we're taking the Old Testament record and then we're looking over here at some practical 20th century applications from these six books. And so these six men will be dealing with these six books and they will be giving practical lessons from these books for 20th century man. They will speak in this uh, given order. On the book of Ezra, Robert Taylor. On the book of Nehemiah, Wendell Winkler. On the book of Esther, Hugo McCord. On the book of uh, Haggai, David Roper. On the book of Zechariah, Eddie Whitten. On the book of Malachi, Dan Winkler. These men will now speak in that particular order. Surely a delight to speak for about five or six minutes in regard to one of the Old Testament worthies, Ezra. I do not recall that his name is used in the New Testament, but he's an outstanding person right after the exile period of God's people in Babylon. In fact, in leading back a portion of the Israelite people from that exile period. I have chosen this morning Ezra 7 and verse 10. It's not a difficult passage to read or to understand. The difficulty, I believe, lies in our challenge or the challenge of putting its four priceless precepts into practice. The passage reads, For Ezra had prepared himself to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Here is an excellent text for a four-point sermon outline. First of all, preparation of heart, a studious disposition. In the third place, application of truth to life. And then in the fourth place, outreach of truth in the lives of other people. Ezra was a prepared person a prepared preacher or teacher. He is listed in Ezra the seventh chapter as a ready scribe. He stands in marked contrast with so many of the scribes about whom we read in the New Testament who were opposed to the Lord and to his disciples. Many of the scribes in the New Testament were far more interested in traditions, the traditions of the elders, than they were in the word of Almighty God. Here is a man that was interested in the law of God Almighty. First of all, we see the preparation of his heart. Solomon, wisest of the ages, declared that we need to keep our hearts with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4 and 23. We read in, in Proverbs 23, How that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are not what you think you are. You and I are what we think. And uh, Paul certainly uh, stresses that in Philippians 4 and verse 8. Jesus declared in Matthew the 12th chapter, verse 34 and 35, that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. We need to major in heart preparation. In the second place, Ezra sought the law of the Lord. This emphasizes his studious disposition. 
The Old Testament said in Isaiah 34 and 16, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Jesus pointed an inquiring lawyer to what is written in the law, how readest thou? Luke 10 and 26. Paul encouraged the young preacher Timothy to study or to give diligence to show himself approved unto God. Hosea's generation was destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. We need to possess a studious disposition. The story has come down through the years that Alexander Campbell held an audience spellbound for a long speech. Somebody inquired of him, Mr. Campbell, how have you accumulated such an array of knowledge? His answer, 40 years of study for 16 hours a day. Brother Gus Nichols made it a practice to study the Bible some four to six hours daily. Brother Franklin Camp has done the same. I understand that Brother L. R. Wilson on one occasion was told by a lady who was impressed with his breadth of knowledge, Brother Wilson, I would give half my life if I knew the Bible as you do. His response, lady, that's what it's cost me, half my life. If we're going to be a benefit to the cause of the Lord, we need to spend hundreds, yea, even thousands of hours in the study of truth. His was a studious disposition. Notice in the next place, he studied and prepared his heart in order that he might do the will of God Almighty. The preface verse in Acts reads, the former treatise of our made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. I've always liked that emphasis, the doing first and then the teaching coming thereafter. I believe that we need to be doers of the word, as James enjoins upon us in the latter part of James, the first chapter. May I urge every young man who is preparing to preach to prepare your heart and to determine that you're going to be a doer of the Word. Three of the easiest ways to lose your influence in the church of our Lord is to become involved with someone of the opposite sex, to become lax and loose in meeting your financial obligations and then to accept some erroneous doctrine and become a false teacher. In the fourth and final place, we have the great outreach of truth, the application of that truth as he sought to teach it into the hearts and lives of the Israelite nation. Notice that his message was statutes, judgments, the law, the truth of God Almighty. Our world does not need more of worldly philosophy. We already have too much of that in the first place. Someone has described worldly philosophy as being somewhat like a blind man in a dark cellar looking for a black cat that never was there in the first place. Our world needs the truth of God Almighty. As preachers, as teachers, as workers in the vineyard of our wonderful God on high, let us, like Ezra of old, prepare our hearts, seek the law of the Lord, do it, and then spend our lives in teaching Israel, spiritual Israel, potentially, and those actually therein, the statutes and judgments of our God. Thank you, Brother Taylor. As there were three deportations of the people of God into Babylonian captivity beginning in about 605 or 606 uh, B.C., there were also three stages of the return, the first one under Zerubbabel, the second under Ezra, and the third one under Nehemiah. And our assignment at this hour is the book of Nehemiah, again dealing with the practical aspect of the book. 
I would like to take out of all of the content found in that sacred book that is so subject to study and development, just one major thrust, and that is the characteristics of leadership as they were found in the man Nehemiah. I would like to begin, first of all, by observing that Nehemiah was a man who was concerned about the welfare of his people. In chapter 1 and in verse 2, the text says that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. This indicates his deep and abiding concern over the welfare of his brethren. In the second place, we read in verses 1 through 4, of hearing of the condition of the people and the state of the wall and how it was broken down, the gates thereof, how it was burned with fire. And then verse 4 says, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. When the text says that he wept and mourned certain days and fasted, we have an indication that this man of God had a heart of compassion. That's the second trait of leadership, a heart that really cares. And then we continue in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1, and in verse 4 again we note that hearing of the state of his city in the walls of Jerusalem, the text there then says, out of that heart that had been broken with care and concern and compassion, that he prayed before the God of heaven. And one of the most beautiful prayers recorded in the Bible is the prayer of Nehemiah in the interest of his people. And thus we have the remaining content of the chapter. So again, he possessed uh, an inclination and an avid uh, belief in the power of prayer. Then in chapter 2, and in verses 1 through 8, we read that being the king's cupbearer, that he bore wine unto the king. But on this occasion, having heard of the state of his people, the text says that he was sad of countenance, which, of course, was inappropriate as he would appear in the presence of the king. But he was so deeply concerned and deeply moved that he totally forgot himself and appeared in the presence of the king sad of countenance. Men who lead people of God must be men who can sing without reservation. The last stanza, stanza four of one of our great hymns, which says, All of thee and none of self. We must be men who, like Paul, have crucified self. And so Nehemiah was one who had forgotten self. Then you will recall that the king gives him permission to go back to the city to take care of the needs existent therein. Now verse 13 says that Nehemiah went on to the went out by night by the gate of the valley even before the dragon well and to the dung port and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Here he is going out and surveying the situation. That's a mark of leadership to survey the needs and the challenges and the opportunities existent in our area of uh, leadership. In the next place, not only was he wise enough to survey the challenges and uh, the situation, the difficulties existent, but then he appealed unto his fellow man to help in that undertaking. And so verse 17 says, Ye see, said Nehemiah to his fellows, the distress that we are in how Jerusalem lieth waste, and so on. Then he says, come, let us build up the wall. That's a mark of leadership. And that is the solicitation and the appeal unto others for assistance and help. And then we read again in that same chapter in verse 17, how that he beckoned unto these his contemporaries to help him in the rebuilding of the wall for this reason. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Here is a mark of leadership. What is it? Concern with the image of the people of God. And then we read also in that same chapter, in verse 19, 
that he had some opposition. Here was Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. And so they said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? And to that, of course, Nehemiah responds and says, Our God, he will prosper us. So what's the point? As a leader, he would not be stopped by opposition. But in that same context, we read that he would not be stopped by opposition, not upon his own individual strength uh, alone, but he said, Our God will prosper us. Hence, he took God uh, into his plans. Then we read that in chapter 6, with the wall having been completed, that these opponents send battle to Tobiah and Geshen come down and say, Come down to the plain of Ono. But he responds to them and says, I can't do that. I'm doing a great work. So what's the point? He would not compromise. Then in verse 6 we read of uh, chapter 4, Concerning the building of the wall, for so built we the wall, we the wall, indicative of the humble heart that he had. And then in verse 20 of that same chapter we're told, In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, and our God, he shall fight for us. So here he is continuing to encourage those who are building the wall. All of that in a nutshell then tells us that... Uh, the 12 characteristics of Nehemiah, which should be incorporated in the hearts of all the leaders of the people of God today, are these. Be concerned with the welfare of the people of God. Possess a heart of compassion. Believe in the power of prayer. Forget yourself. Be wise enough to survey the difficulties at hand. Appeal to others for help. Be concerned about the image of the people of God. Never be stopped by opposition. Take God into your plans. Never compromise truth. Be humble and continue to encourage. Brother Robert Taylor is an illustration, a living illustration of the sermon outline he gave you. Brother Wendell Winkler is a living illustration of the sermon outline he has given you. And that's the way it should be with all of us to be living epistles. But each one must keep striving in that way. I appreciate getting to review with you a few thoughts from the book of Esther. One of my favorites, and it becomes more precious with the years, Several things Brother Wendell said, give it one, two, three, and four, what these men can take home to preach. I hope that you will, if you haven't recently preached on the book of Esther, get with it. Now, this book has been the subject of criticism. The name of God is not mentioned in it. And for that reason, some said it doesn't belong in the Bible. However, that was not a problem with Josephus. When he announced that there are only 22 books that we consider sacred. And when you check what he meant by the 22, we can't go into it now. He meant the 39. For example, he, he listed all 12 of the minor prophets in one book. So you can see how he concentrated things. He got down to 22 books, but it includes the book of Esther. That criticism didn't affect Jesus Christ. For he considered all these 39 as being the Bible, Luke 24, 44. But some still criticize the book of Esther, even up to 90 A.D. at the council of Jemnia, down close to Ashkelon, when a group of Jews decided it does belong, but they really couldn't decide it. It had already been decided. All they were doing was just rubber stamping it, just corroborating what had already been decided. A precious book it is, and the first of these points, Brother Wendell's sermons, 
always is so well outlined and ought to be. The first is this word Shushan in verse 2. One of the things about the book of Esther is that a long time the scholars could criticize there never was such a city as Shushan or Susa, all made up. They could say that until 1901, if I remember the detail, when the archaeologists found the ancient city of Susa. Hammurabi's palace, and then the palace in which Esther lived. And you get the books on archaeology and read about this city and its discovery, and the tall pillars that were there, still there. Susa is in southwest Iran. We had it on our schedule to go there in 75 and got blocked out. I'm glad I can't go now. I don't want to be there now. But in Iran, in southwest Iran, the city of Susa, I wanted to go there. And you see some of the very pillars still there that Esther saw when she lived in this beautiful palace. Look down through those verses 2 through 8, the description of the palace, which at one time was thought as being mythical, all made up, just a fairy tale, the story of Esther. But now there is archaeological confirmation of the capital city. So that's the first thing that I believe. That's faith building to me. Second, look at verse 9, that word Vashtar. No, we haven't gotten to Esther yet, the girl, the beautiful girl, but don't pass over the story of Vashtar. This woman had respect for her modesty. And though her husband, their now, wife is supposed to be in subjection to her husband, but not in everything. If he says, you drive the car while I rob a bank, obeying your husband's gone too far. And if a husband says, expose yourself, you're beautiful to these half-drunken men sitting here. Vestar says, I'm not going to do it even for a kingdom. And she knew the price of it. She had more quality in her and a deeper character than some girls today that have been dipped in water. Let's think it through. God sees everything. Here is a woman of character. Way back in ancient, I don't think she ever saw a Bible. But as Brother Lanier referred to this morning from Romans 2, she had a law written in her heart. She never saw a written Bible. But somehow she knew that you ought to be modest. And she lived by her standards and she had to pay a price for it. So she is a heroine in the Bible. I'm not saying she's going to heaven. Judge nothing before the time, as far as that's concerned. I don't know that situation. But I know she's to be more admired than some young ladies today. But go out in public with shorts on where men are. I think she's much more to be admired. And there's some mothers that take up for their daughters dressing that way. So that's an important point and should not be neglected and there's much more could be said about it. But I'm just giving a few minutes. And the third thing, over in the second chapter, verse 7, we'll get to this beautiful girl, Esther. And the maiden was fair and beautiful. But every one of you, remember that your mother taught you pretty is as pretty does. And the fact that she had a pretty face was not the most important thing. You remember back in about Second Samuel 14 about Absalom, that in all Israel there was no one to compare with him in handsomeness from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. He was beautiful, the Bible tells us. 
but his heart was ugly and treacherous and wanted to kill his daddy. Pretty is as pretty does. Thank God Esther was pretty both ways. Not only outside, but inside. Look at verse 20 of the same chapter. Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. She was away from home now, and she was living in a palace, but she didn't look down her nose at the man who had become her father. And she remembered what he had taught her, even though she was now away from home. Admirable? Yes, this book belongs in the Bible. Then the chief thing is in the fourth chapter. When Mordecai sent word to this girl about the decree that all Jews must die, and maybe, Esther, you'll be able, in your position of influence, to do something no one else can do. And he appealed to her in three ways. I wish you would note them. Verse 13 is one of them. Verse 14 is the other two. So a foster father reasoning with her, his married daughter, don't you think that just because you're living in the king's palace, that you can save your own neck. You're a Jew too, Esther. That would make a woman think. One could take that position. Now, I know the rest of my folks are going to be killed, but I'm in the king's palace. I won't be hurt if she was selfish. If she is selfish. Now her foster father says, don't you think you're going to be an exception just because you're where you are? You're a Jew. It'll be found out. So that's the first motivation he put before. Second, now if you decide to stay mum, to keep quiet, and try to not let anyone know that you're a Jew, don't you think that the Jews are going to die. There will be deliverance to them from some other source. All oh, the faith and the providence. God not in this book. God's all the way through it. Providence. His name doesn't have to be mentioned. Mordecai's faith. He believed in Genesis 12:3. He knew the Jews had a purpose to bring the glorious Messiah into the world. He had faith in that. He knew the Jews couldn't be exterminated. He knew they couldn't. He didn't know how God was going to work it out, but he knew he would. So he said, Esther, deliverance will come from some other source if you let God down. And the third, and that's the most important, a sermon all by itself. Look, who knows but that you come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That ought to put her on a pedestal as well as on a spot. I believe that's true about each one of us. Jesus believed that. I'm not personally important, but God sent me for a purpose. He that sent me is with me. He hath not left me alone. John 8, 29. There are three things in John 8, 29. And two of them you and I need to emulate and to try our best on the third. Jesus was perfect in all three. I fall short on number three but we're to die trying. But I believe, just as Mordecai believed, Esther, you're in this generation, in this city, in this spot, 
to do God's will. Don't let him down. Esther, God has put you here. Jesus said, he that sent me. He sent Esther. He sent Jesus. He sent you for a purpose. Say it then. He that sent me is with me. Believe in God's providence. You don't feel him. Esther didn't feel him, but she knew he was there. Mordecai taught her. She believed it, and she acted upon it. He that sent me is with me. He hath not left me alone. She had to go in with shaking knees before the king. Physically unaccompanied. But she knew she wasn't alone. And like Jesus, she tried her best at least to do all those things that are pleasing in his sight. We'll turn over just a few pages to the book of uh, Haggai. I feel very strange speaking on the book of Haggai without a building program. Every place I've ever lived, we had a building program, and I always keep Haggai in my back pocket for those occasions. But of course, there's a great many things to be built in the Lord's church other than just buildings. And the lessons that are here, of course, apply in so many ways. We've already had Ezra, Nehemiah spoken of, the three returns mentioned. The first return under Zerubbabel, Joshua, as they came back to rebuild the temple. They started that job. They, of course, did not finish that job. There was opposition. Some 15 years had gone by, and finally two prophets are raised up of God to try to get them to finish that job. There's a lesson right there. These two men are Haggai and Zechariah. Zechariah, of course, will be spoken of in just a moment. Zechariah is, I suppose, what I would think of as a more typical prophet who speaks visions and so on. Haggai, though, doesn't deal a great deal in that type of thing. Speaks of the future only, uh, incidentally almost, but he's right exactly to the point. There's a need that exists, and he speaks to that need. And the need is that of building the house of God. Of course, those of us who are the spiritual house of God can find, as I said, so many lessons. The three basic appeals as made by Haggai, and they can form so quickly the basis of three points to any, any lesson on building. He starts off in the first chapter in the second year of Darius the king, as I said, some 15 years have gone by now. They haven't done the job. And he's going to speak to Zerubbabel and to Joshua the high priest. His first appeal to them on this occasion is that they need to put first things first. Now, they had gone without the temple throughout their Babylonian captivity. They had gone now without the temple for 15 years and they were getting along fine. You can get used to mediocrity. Did you know that? You can get used to things being in a mess. You can get hardened to situations. You can lose your zeal. You can lose your enthusiasm and just be content to just ease alone through life. Well, he speaks to them. He says in verse 4, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed or paneled houses, and this house lie waste. They were letting the work of God just slide by. On the other hand, they were taking care of themselves in fine shape. And of course, immediately in so many places where I've been, I think uh, uh, literally of houses and the abodes that we have, and sometimes as we take care of ourselves, but as far as even the meeting places sometimes where we meet, those do not compare with the kind of houses we have for ourselves. But more importantly would be things like time, things like talents, things like, uh, uh, well, just all the abilities and blessings that God gives to us. 
So many times we use them for self, do we not? And we neglect the work of God. Thus he says in verse 6, you're just putting wages in a bag with holes. Anytime you live a life where you emphasize self and you neglect God, all of the blessings, all the time you put forth, all the talent you uh, use, all the talents you use, all of these are just putting things in bag with holes. In the end, they will amount to nothing whatsoever. Chapter 2 is the second appeal. This particular appeal now comes a month later. Apparently, they made a start, but they got discouraged. Does that sound familiar? Made a start, but got discouraged. Probably uh, uncovered the foundations of the old temple. When they did that, they saw the size of Solomon's temple. They saw what had been in the past. They saw now what they were accomplishing. And thus it says in verse 3, that which they were doing seemed as nothing. Well, the second great message of Haggai to them is, look to the future. Just don't look at the present. Look at the future. See the possibilities. Be lifted up by what can be with the help of God. And thus he says in verse 9, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. Now there's speculation on exactly what he meant. Whether well, he meant just the, the, the spiritual glory is going to be greater because of what's presently happening, or whether as time went on and uh, say we get on down to Herod's temple, that even uh, this particular structure would end up uh, more glorious literally than that which had happened uh, uh, in Solomon's temple. I think probably there's even some implication of the far future because the two verses previously are quoted in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, referring to the end of things. But whatever the exact implication he's saying, if you'll stay with God, it's going to work out. If you'll stay with God, you're going to be successful. And, of course, God does not always uh, take success or measure success as we measure it. But looking through the eyes of God, things can be glorious. As it already, already has been noted, we today, of course, have um, problems. We today uh, can have the, the doomsayers uh, speaking with great emphasis but nevertheless, we need to realize if we look at this thing from the eyes of God, great things can happen yea today. The glory of today can be even greater. So many messages then are presented to us. One last, verse 10. A couple of more months go by. They still have not done the job. There's a final appeal, and I just call this one, Stop Your Excuses. Stop Your Excuses. He says to them, for instance, that unless you get busy, your offerings are going to be unclean. Verse 14, again, he says to them in the verses that follow, you're talking about bad times, you're talking hard times. Does that sound familiar? You're talking hard times, but if you'll stay with God, you're going to have what you need. God will bless you. Stop talking hard times. Do the work of God. Do what has to be done. And God will indeed bless you. There's one last appeal here, one last uh, message that he has, which has to do with Zerubbabel as a type of Christ that will not speak on. But those three basic things, as presented by Haggai, as he challenged them, it's time to rise up and build. Following this, we have the visions of uh, Zechariah. And then a short time after that, the temple was built. Stay with God. The job will be done. I want to center our study concerning the book of Zechariah around verse uh, chapter 4 and verse 6. This will be the center of our uh, notice this morning. Zechariah is, comes along on the scene about two months following the appearance of Haggai. And of course, as David has already alluded to, uh, these two prophets had to do with the rebuilding of the temple. In 520 B.C., under, under the leadership of Governor Zerubbabel, the building of the temple was the primary purpose of 
the two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest or of a priestly family, if the references in Ezra 5.1 and 6.14 certainly refer to him as the son of or the grandson of a priest named Ido. And uh, in this context, he does encourage the people of uh, Israel there to build the temple. There was uh, turmoil throughout the province of the of Persia, Persian Empire, and yet in chapter 1 and verse 11, the angel in one of these visions uh, speaks of the fact that all the earth is still, sits still, and is at rest. And of course, I believe that this refers to primarily the fact that all opposition to the rebuilding of the temple that stopped the rebuilding of it in the first place 16 years before was at an end. And so now then, uh, in very brief form, we notice three applications or three aspects of the book of Zechariah. Number one, the analysis and the contents of the book. The first six chapters deals with a series of eight night visions and a coronation scene uh, for the purpose of encouraging the people to rebuild the temple. The second section of the book, chapters 7 and 8, is an appeal to practical activity. Uh, he emphasizes in this portion of the book that Israel's fast shall become festivals. And then in the last section of the book, chapters 9 through 14, uh, deal with some aspects of the history of Israel and the revelation of some of its future triumphs in the kingdom of God. Number two, some of the abiding lessons that we find in the book. Number one is how the drooping faith of a community may be revived through the preaching of a sincere and earnest prophet hiding himself in the message of God. Oh, it's very difficult not to stop right there and just preach a sermon on hiding ourselves in the message of God. That's the sincere uh, preaching, uh, the preaching of a sincere and earnest prophet hiding himself in the message of God will encourage the spiritual uh, activity of community. Number two, there can be a, no permanent social blessedness outside of the church. Now, we could elaborate on that, and you can think about that for a moment, but there can be no social blessedness outside of the church, without the church. Number three, how Israel's contest was really with Satan. Satan is always the chief assailant of the church. And number four, how a failing or how a fasting and feasting are within themselves nothing. But what God requires of his people is the doing of justice, mercy, truth, and righteousness. And then lastly, how the rebellious flock will mourn just as soon as they recognize the fact that they are at war with God. These are some of the abiding lessons. Now then, for a very brief moment, some applications concerning Nehemiah 4.6. I believe that this is one of the, if there be such a thing, Brother Turner, as a key verse of any book, I believe Nehemiah 4.6 is probably, I mean, Zechariah 4.6 is probably the key verse of this book. Because it says... As the uh, angel refers there to Zerubbabel and, and to Zechariah, says, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now this is the way that 
that uh, Zechariah and Haggai and all the people are going to build that temple. Not by their own power, not by their own might, but by the Spirit of God. And so we notice these uh, very few applications. Number one, with that kind of an attitude toward uh, the Spirit of God and the power of God, rather than our own, we can, number one, build the house of God. Now, as the, as the political situation was in turmoil and, and upheaval throughout the Persian Empire at this particular time, there was no application, there was no opposition to the building of the house of God. Isn't that our situation today? Our political situation is always in an upheaval, and it always will be. But there's no opposition to the building of the house of God. And with an attitude of, by thy power and by thy might, we shall do what you want us to do. We can build the spirit, build the house of God. There's would be would be the uh, spirit of love for God, not self, prevalent. There would be a spirit of love for the brethren, lifting one another up instead of tearing each other down. Spirit of love for humankind, evangelistic in nature. Number two, there would be bring peace to the world through Jesus. The church is the salt of the earth. And uh, the preserving power that preserves the earth. Number three, it would build happy, strong homes. If we just had that spirit that God's uh, power and God's might and not my own, it would uh, 